you convince a reader with your novel that um, a person, a unique person, is a world that didn't exist ever before and will never exist again, that that, that one life has infinite value, I think that in and of itself is a lot. I didn't grow up in an atmosphere of accomplished storytelling. I mean, sometimes you hear about families where the grandfather just told amazing tales, or the father or the mother, whatever it was. I didn't really have that, I have to say. But there were things that were much more subtle, and there were experiences that were somehow communicated in underground ways. Just to give you a sense of the picture, I mean, my grandparents all came from four different places, and those places had never been returned to, more or less, by any of them, maybe with one exception. So they came from one world. They either chose not to return to it, or they couldn't return to it because the place didn't exist anymore. So imagine what it is to come from a nothing. I mean, when you, when you travel to other places, like Scandinavia, where you have these fam families who have lived in these houses for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you ask them, where will you be in another hundred years? It's here. I have no sense like, of that at all in my family. The idea of a home, which is a kind of rooted place that you come from and can plan on being in, in the future, wasn't important. It just wasn't part of the vocabulary. This one came from here, that one came from there. My mother. But because of the winds of history, blew, blew her parents to England. She was born in England, she grew up there. She met my father in Israel. He grew up there, they came to America. It, in a certain way, place, the specifics of geography, were accidental and therefore not much emphasis could ever be put on them. I guess I'm interested in serious things because it seems to me that that's, I don't know, that's what I've always gone to literature for. It's a relief to me to open a book by a writer I love. Suddenly all the noise of life and the small talk and the pettiness and the things that are inessential, they suddenly drop away. You open a book, I don't know, open Newt Homsen's Hunger or, or open a book by W.G. Sebal or whoever you love, Thomas Bernhard. Everything that, that doesn't matter is gone in an instant. And you're in a world where everything matters in the most critical way. And I find that I, I, I wanted to live. I wanted to live there. I wanted to make a life there. And so I guess I tried to become a writer. Um, I think there were many things involved. But looking back, I think there must have been some sense that not only was writing a chance to express myself. It's too easy to express, well, we, we can express ourselves in a conversation like this. I think it was something else. I, I think I recognized that it was a chance to create myself, to actually decide for myself who I was going to be. And that's an incredibly exciting idea. It's radical in a certain sense, particularly when you're young, you're 14 years old, and almost everything in your life is decided for you. Your parents decide your family, your school, the peer pressure, your friends. There's this whole world, the cosmos, that is pressuring you into a shape. And then you have this blank page. And on that page you can decide to become anything and say anything. And you show it to someone or you don't. And years later you publish it or you don't. But that possibility, absolute freedom, as far as you're willing to go, it's up to you, right? And this chance to become something to invent yourself, I think for me has always been incredibly enticing. And to this day, it's probably the most compelling reason to write. But as a writer, I could be an old man at the end of his life. I could be um, somebody who lives in London, 
I could be a, a Jewish refugee from Germany. I could be someone from Chile, a country I'd never been to. I could be anything. And I, there is always a sense for me when I'm creating a character or many characters that I'm escaping finality. I'm escaping the finitude of life. That I'm, and I'm expanding the horizons of, of me, of my experience in life. So I only have one. I've only been given one life, unfortunately. I would have liked to have more. I would have liked to have, you know, other choices, and those choices lead to those choices. But I only can take this particular one route that I've taken in my life. But as a writer, I mean, that's in life. When I close the door of my office and start work every day, I'm, I'm multiplying those possibilities. I'm having a chance to live all kinds of things that I wouldn't otherwise have lived, and I really feel that I'm living them. When I become, or I'm writing some character I, I just read just now in the other room. You know, an old man, a father, who's, who, who feels he's um, terribly ruined his relationship with his son. He somehow never managed to express himself to this child. And he's facing his own death. And how can he write this wrecked, slightly wrecked relationship? It's not an experience I'll, I'll ever have, could ever have, would never want in life necessarily. But I want it because I'm curious about what it is to be there. How I'm curious about the, that extreme. Um, and writing allows me that in a kind of um, really often very, very fierce way. find a character in a moment of weakness, whether it's a moment of failure or doubt or loss or suffering within himself, you find him often at his most human. And that interests me. That's where I want to go. And I, it's not to, to, to rub my nose in it or rub the reader's nose in these difficult things. It's because I think that when we have an opportunity to sit with those difficult things for a while, we also find a way to transcend them. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I also don't mean to be overly hopeful, but I do think that, it, that there is something in facing these things, which constantly in life we're given opportunities to turn away from, whether it be death or whether it be something about ourselves, which we've, we've hidden from ourselves all our lives, but which our entire life is, is buried, uh, is built on this lie. That interests me in a character, and that's the spot that I'm drawn to, that lie or that, that place under which the entire structure, you know, the, that is hidden under the whole structure of the character. What happens if you remove it? Does the character fall? Or can she find a way to build herself again in a new way? I'm, I'm not a writer because I'm interested in solipsism or in solitude, frankly. I'm really interested in and really care for that moment when one transcends that and, and has the, the most possible, most profound contact, communication with another person. How, how close can you get to another person? That's always interesting me and it's there from the first book. A man walks into a room, there's an experiment where a memory is extracted from one mind and transplanted to another mind to see, is there some way to short a shortcut to empathy, because what is empathy after all but being in somebody else's shoes, knowing what it feels like to be another person. And the experiment is a, is a, is a complete failure. And I think for me, what I was really asking, I was 25 when I wrote that book, I had just started to write, it was the first fiction I ever wrote, but I was asking the question is, is there anything else that can do what literature can do? And what, what can literature do that nothing else can do, is another way to ask the question. And that is, it gives us this opportunity to stand in another person's inner life and feel what it is to be him or her in the most intense way. I don't think there's anything else in life that gives us that. And that interests me, that the possibility of contact, of, of understanding, of empathy, of compassion. That, my books are always leading towards that, but they, they begin with characters who are solitary because I think, I might be wrong because I've only ever been inside my own mind, but I think it's quite an effort to make that kind of real, profound contact with another person, to truly understand them. There's so many layers to get through. But I think all my characters are yearning for that, or leaning towards that 
moment with another person. I'm particularly moved not by the way the past impacts us or shapes us. We know it does. There's no way around it. We're all in, in such deep ways, chiseled, shaped, stamped by the past, by our parents, by our grandparents, by history. Okay, so we know that to begin with. Then what do you do with that? What, what really moves me is not that in and of itself, but how people respond to it by somehow recreating themselves. So if you look at all three of my books, and I didn't know this writing them, but now that I have to look back and answer journalists' questions about them, I see that they're all in some ways about this idea, maybe it's a kind of almost overly optimistic American idea, I don't know, I never thought about it until just this minute, but the idea that we make ourselves to some degree. Yes, the, the past shapes us, but what then? And you take a character like Leo Gursky, who by sheer imagination and willpower reinvents himself and his life and his past to, to make it bearable. I think he says at some point in the history of love, um, the truth is the thing that I invented so that I could survive. And Alma does it with her younger brother to make this kind of hero out of her father. And Samson Green in, in Man Walks Into a Room, you know, he's, he has this enormous loss that he suffers. 24 years of his life are gone. But he has, to reinvent, he has to find a new coherence in order to create a sense of self again. Or in Great House, when you have the, this title story, which is one of the most beautiful stories from Jewish history, I think which is what happens to the Jews in the first century AD when Jerusalem falls. And everything that they were, Judaism was a national idea, it was based on a place and it was based on, on rituals around the temple. These things are lost and destroyed. Who can these people be? And the answer to that is so beautiful. Okay, we'll replace sacrifice at the temple with prayer, which is internal and we can carry it with us anywhere. And well, we've lost the city, but we'll translate the city into the most intricate book in the world, which became, after many centuries, the Talmud. And we can carry it under our arm. And suddenly, Judaism became something internal and portable. So these moments of radical reinvention of an individual, of a, of a whole people, I guess that's what moves me most, because I must feel in some way that it isn't sufficient, it isn't acceptable simply to inherit the past to be shaped by it. Oh, it's not, it's not fair. <laughs> How can we live like that? What choice do we have? It seems that we have to have some say in the matter of who we are. And I don't, say, I don't think that we have complete say, obviously. I'm writing all the time about how, about the burden of inheritance, I guess you might say. I mean, if you think of your own memory, or the memory that, memories that were passed down to you from your parents and your grandparents, you know, that's not really what happened. What you remember is not really what happened in your life. You've taken this enormous portion of time, however many years you've been alive, and you've just blacked out huge portions of it that were useless to you or didn't quite work and didn't fit in with the narrative. But then you chose these moments, you illuminated these moments, very few of them, and you strung them together to create this coherence. And that's who you are, and that's the story you tell yourself. You're a fiction writer. We all are, right? But that fiction is the fiction of the self. I mean, this goes back to my idea of writing as if the creation of self. I think it's probably not only writers who do it. I'm sure it's not. I think that is, that is how we create um, who we are. And it's something a little frightening, but it's also something, I guess, quite empowering. Because then the past isn't something that lands on your head and that you have to deal with for the rest of your life and just live under the shadow of it. No, you have this imagination. Make something out of it. I haven't written poems for many, many years, and I, I hope I'll go back to them. I don't think of myself as somebody who wrote poems and then stopped and moved on to something else. But I have to say that the shape of a novel seems to fit me, at least at this moment in my life, it seems to fit me very well. I think it has something to do with the fact that, as a form, it's so poorly defined. 
And because of that, because we can only say, oh, well, it's a long story with the beginning and end, but what more can we say about it? I feel I have an opportunity, or I'm being asked by the novel to reinvent it every time I sit down to write one. And I find that very exciting. I think poems, um, they're, they're more well-defined in a way. At least I couldn't find that same freedom writing them. And it was because I couldn't find it, because I kept hitting a wall, that I stopped and, and began to write my first novel. Not thinking that I'd become a novelist, just thinking that I, I might be able to find a window of escape to be free again in my work. And lo and behold, I found that, but I found much more than that. I found that in the novel, there was a sense of uh, imperfection. It could never be perfect because the form is not defined. So, And none of us can think of a perfect novel. I think every novel has flaws. So that's a relief. I like that. I feel comfortable with certain kinds of failures, knowing in advance that they're going to exist. My novels have never had any kind of plan or blueprint that I've made up in advance. They're complete improvisations. And for the most part, particularly the last two novels, which are polyphonic, so they're made up of different parts that begin to interlock together to create this whole. Um, the, in the beginning, the first maybe 20, 30 pages of those books, I wrote maybe slightly out of order. Maybe I discovered Leo Gursky and then Alma Singer or, or in Great House. I discovered all four characters at the same time. And once I knew that they were going to be the novel, I wrote the book exactly in the order you read it. So I never knew it was going to happen. And I wrote, you know, the entirety of one character's experience, then the next one, but then the next one began to echo with the first one. And I began to find all these patterns between them, and I would sometimes extend the pattern, or I'd sometimes perversely break the pattern if it seemed too inauthentic somehow, too forced. But it's like, for me, it's a little bit like writing music. How could you know in advance until you get there and discover the harmonies between these remote parts of the novel? And for me, it's always with a sense of creating this larger shape, the larger whole. Um, and and I, I just simply couldn't write it any other way. The other thing is I would be completely bored. Why would I write the book if I already knew it was going to happen? I never understood that. Well, it's like um, there are certain strands of life, of personal experience, that are used, but they're woven into something that is, would be unrecognizable to anyone even who knew me intimately, I think. When I'm writing a novel, I think there is a kind of longing to create a home in the way that I'm describing. The, this elusive idea of home, which I've never quite had, is a sense that somehow by bringing all these strands together, bit like a, like a mockingbird, I mean, bits of glittery personal things, but also complete inventions, and things that fascinate me or move me or sadden me. If I can find some form that they can be perfectly woven together into this kind of architecture, then that would be home. At least for the time being while I'm writing the book. As soon as it's finished, I can't live in it anymore. It's finished, the door is closed, and it gets published, and I have to move, I guess, so to speak. I really think of the, the novels spatially um, as these kind of houses with rooms that I'm building as if from, from the inside. And I'm pulling all these parts together, but it, you're right to, to say, to suggest that it comes somehow from this diasporic experience of a life scattered, you know, all over the globe. How do you pull those pieces back and form a whole again? I think that's some obsession in some way that that's, you can find in all of the books. it all as a, as a continue, on a continuum. I don't think of painting or music as separate from books. They do different things in different ways. But they, take, they all take me to that same place, which is that place apart. Um, that place where things uh, have a chance of being meaningful. You know, the, it's, I don't know, a kind of consolation. Because otherwise life happens in this haphazard way. And you don't have time to put the pieces together to assemble them into some kind of meaning. Then you write, or you stand in front of a painting, 
that just moves you so profoundly because it means something. You know, to you but, and on its own. I don't know. Think about paintings that, have, that I keep returning to in my life, like Rembrandt's late self-portraits, which I think I keep... I think I've written about them in all three novels, maybe even the same one in all of them. But I just had the chance to see my favorite of those portraits came to New York to the Met. Metropolitan Museum of Art for a few weeks. And I went to it many days in a row just to see this old friend. And you stand in front of that. And again, it's that same feeling of just suddenly being in touch with the most essential things. I think that so many things are being lost so quickly that we almost don't have a measure for it. I mean, what is it, 15 years on now that, we, that we've all been on the internet? And Google is only, what? as old as 2002, it's not that old. Um, 10 years on, our brains have changed in such shocking ways. And one of the things that's gone, as we all know, um, is our concentration. And instead of a deep reading, where you have a chance to make these complex connections and allusions and find meaning, we're all been trained to just think very, very, very fast. And I think that's scary. Obviously, this kind of experiment um, has unwittingly been done on this younger generation. Not our children. Maybe our, for our children, by the time they're a little bit older, we'll have figured some of this out. But kids a little older than them, teenagers, have basically been sort of guinea pigs for what it is to be raised not in a world of slowness, where things happen at the pace that they've been happening more or less since for hundreds of years, thousands of years. It hasn't changed all that much until now. Um, and we we'll see what's happened to them. And I think you see not just um, real difficulties in their relationships to each other, but the, the absolute inability to concentrate uh, on a long piece of writing. As a novelist, it's incredibly sad, of course, and there are all kinds of things that make it harder and harder and harder for the kind of books that I love and that I grew up with and that I still value um, to find new readers. You know, the loss of bookstores and the rise of e-books. There are fewer and fewer chances for a person to stumble into a bookstore and discover a writer who changes their life or have to have the patience to find the space, the corner in their life that's quiet enough and, and slow enough to actually be able to read it. Um, and I find all of that sad. By the same token, I have to imagine that something will, will slowly begin to correct itself. I don't think that people will start reading. Maybe less people will read. I, don't think, I think there will always be, at least in my lifetime, in our lifetime, I think there will always be an audience for the kind of novels that matter to me. Um, and that's enough. I don't think I need tons of people. Um, I wish that everyone loved the kind of novels that I love. Um, but as long as some people love them and they can still be in print, I guess that's enough. Well, I guess I, I think that the writer is at his or her best in the work. And I think the work is always in some way political because it's always about relationships between people. And it's also always about, um, it's always championing the individual. Um, which, you know, over the masses. Every novel which, is, uh, which gets a reader to care about one person and his or her unique world um, is doing something quite political in that, I think. Not meaning to, not necessarily, that's not the, necessarily the, the main goal. But it is, inevitably, a kind of political act. If you say, to, if you convince a reader with your novel that um, a person, a unique person, is a world that didn't exist ever before and will never exist again. That, that, that one life has infinite value. You're teaching them something politically, I think. Um, so yes, maybe, I'm, maybe that's a kind of vague thing. But I think that in and of itself is a lot. It does make it harder, yeah. Everything makes it harder. Getting older makes it harder. Having written one book and not wanting to write the same book again. Mm being aware of all the ways in which a book can fail, which I didn't know the first time I read a book. Yes, it's harder, but 
it gets more and more serious. And the stakes are higher, not because of anyone else, not because of any awards, and not because of an audience, but for myself. I have a better and better sense of myself as a writer. I mean, after three books, I can say, okay, now I think I have an idea of what I want to do, you know? And I'll probably say that always, because with each book, I learn something. It gets deeper. Life, as I get older, as we all get older, I think it becomes more profound. You have children. It changes everything. You know, you get older, people start to die around you. It changes everything. Your parents become ill. Whatever those things are, life is not as light as it was when you're young. And I think if you're a kind of writer who wants to write about those things, the work just keeps opening new new ground under you, new abysses that you have to get lost in. Um, so yes, it gets harder, but I think I'm up for that. Thank you very much. Thank you.